Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we've got an exciting episode helping you, the home grower, with a whole bunch of helpful tips to help you in making decisions on potting plants within your garden. This lesson is titled 7-Eleven Potting Tips. The seven don'ts as well as the 11 do's when caring for your potted plants. These lessons virtually apply to all potted plants, whether they be citrus, any other fruit trees, um, as well as your ficus, your house plants, and any other ornamental. These lessons pretty much apply to all plant health and plant care as it relates to your potted plants. And because we've got seven don'ts plus 11 do's, a total of 18 tips that we're gonna go over. Let's get started right away. My first tip is to select a pot that is light and porous. A lighter pot, such as this one here, will reflect most of the light and basically better protect the root ball from overheating, especially in those hot summer days. These black pots, on the contrary, absorb a lot of heat during the summer. I've seen some researchers putting a thermometer near a black container that's in the sun in the middle of a long, hot summer day, and the temperature has exceeded 115, 120 degrees on the pot. That's just simply cooking the root ball, and plants simply do not like it. Do not use black plastic as your preferred choice of pot. However, if you keep it shaded, it's fine. So that's my tip as it relates to using black pots. Do not use black containers unless they are shaded. My preferred pot is using something like this, which is a clay porous pot. Porous in the sense that if you water it, even the pot is absorbing water and will basically return water back to the root zone even after watering. Whereas a glazed ceramic pot such as this one, you can see has this shine to it. This glaze is not porous and doesn't offer the benefits as this pot otherwise would. So my second do when it comes to potted plant care is make sure that the pot has holes underneath it. There should be holes at the bottom of the container. If you come in around here, you can see that my preferred pot has a hole right in there. But some of these other cute pots, which I found in my collection, have no holes at all. You can see this one here has no holes in it, as does this one, no holes. And if you were to pot directly into this, when you water, being that the water cannot escape, that root ball is going to drown, lead to root rot, and lead to a whole bunch of other diseases because it is vital to the plant health that that water um, basically passes through the pot when you go to watering your plants. So the second do is make sure your pots have holes within the containers, and if they don't, you're gonna have to add that prior to preparing your potted plant. So the next tip is for your potted plants, use a potting mix. Sounds obvious, but I see this mistake all the time with growers. If you take a look here on the bag, you can find this at, I'm here in Los Angeles, so a lot of Southern California nurseries, you'll find this product over here that reads raised bed and potting mix. And if you don't wanna make your own soil, which let's come in and let me share with you um, what this product looks like. But if you take a look in here, you can actually see what the product's made out of. I can see that there's a lot of like wood chips in here. And I can also see that there's these white um, little globes, which are basically perlite. And we're gonna talk about perlite in just a second over here. So um, you can just simply buy a potting mix or you can make your own potting mix. And um, if you take a look, this here is one of the ingredients. When you make your own potting mix, I typically recommend making a three part potting soil consisting of one third perlite, one third vermiculite, and one third P. 
peat moss, but the preferred, more um, eco-friendly alternative to using peat moss. This is just something I've had in my um, collection for the last couple of years, but the trend is to use coconut core instead, just being that it's just far more abundant, whereas the moss in the bogs takes takes many years up to decades in order for those sources to replenish themselves compared to coconut core that has an unlimited supply. So um, coconut core will, will accomplish the same objective of absorbing a lot of water and adding organic material to the potting mix to continuously um, feed and break down and ultimately feed the potted plant. If we take a look now um, at perlite, let's talk about what the benefits of perlite are. This here is one package which talks about over here and basically says perlite improves drainage and aeration and potting mixes and over here helps prevent soil compaction promotes strong development and excellent for starting cuttings and if you take a look what this looks like we just saw what perlite looked like when mixed this is here perlite in its pure form if you take a look over here this one is vermiculite and vermiculite the benefits are improves moisture and nutrient retention um, in potting mixes and garden soils, aids in faster seed germination, prevents soil compaction, and increases aeration. So if you take a look at this, this here is what vermiculite looks like in pure form. And then we've got peat moss over here, retains moisture and nutrients. If you haven't noticed the pattern with both vermiculite, perlite, and this peat moss, they're all talking about retaining moisture. This is highly important compared to simply using a product like this. This doesn't say anything about potting. This is simply compost, something to amend and improve the soil structure. And this here will not retain wa water in the same way that these products will. And, um, and therefore do not use this in your potting mixes. And again, now that we're talking about the don'ts, one of my do not tips is do not use non-potting soil mixes and do not use native soil. Again, the point being that a potting mix should be something that's highly um, great at retaining water and moisture as well as also being excellent for creating aeration, allowing water to pass so that you also don't result in a phenomenon known as root rot and, and basically creating an environment that will create disease um, and pass and ultimately shorten the life of your potted plant. So, so as we continue this way, I wanna share the comparison with these um, two more products over here that I've got. This one over here says sphagnum moss. If we open it up and take a look at it, sphagnum moss is this product. And I'm not talking about using this as the one third for your soil mix. The one third you'd be using is this peat moss, which is simply composted moss. And if you take a look at this product, you can see even though it's derived from this material, it's composted and broken down. So a completely different product is peat moss, again, compared to sphagnum moss. And then the last product I wanna share with you that I love is Gary's Best Top Pot. And what's so cool about what Gary's done is he's created a potting soil that is a permanent soil. So this is a new concept in growing. And I've been working with growers for the last couple of years that are basically, um, and this is really evolving, not just your potted plants, but also your in-ground plantings, which we're gonna be doing some in the upcoming months. But you're gonna notice that we're putting a lot less organics into the soil as those are simply going to diminish in a very short period of time. We're talking about in a matter of months and result in the displacement of the plant. If you take a look at Gary's top pot on the back here, you'll see here that their ingredients include peat moss, which we've just discussed. Pumice is simply volcanic rock, which again is a mineral and will not break down. Perlite is another mineral we just discussed that will not break down. Sand, another mineral which will not break down. And charcoal, which is obviously derived from burnt carbon, burnt wood, um, breaks down very slowly. And even peat moss is a very slow to break down organic material. So the goal is when potting your plants in Gary's top pot, and this is um, um, basically created by um, Gary from the Laguna Hills Nursery located in Orange County. Um, and they also carry a lot of the Ivy Organics products. 
but he is the first person that I've seen that has created a permanent soil, which is ideal for your potted plants. And when you don't use a permanent soil, let me share with you what the effect of that can be on a potted plant, which I've got here to my left. So this year was simply, this year is one of my figs. Um, again, we're here now the um, first week of October. You can see that there's still remnants of figs that are still left on this tree. And if you take a look at the soil, um, you can see that we are at least two inches below the rim of the soil, whereas when I initially potted it, I was only about maybe a half an inch, just enough so that when I watered it, the water would um, basically soak the root zone. So um, you can see that within the last year and a half, it has sunk in almost two inches from its initial planting zone, and we're gonna end up repotting this. You can see that this entire root is also exposed um, to the elements, being especially um, excess sunburn. You can see the pruned branches we're gonna um, be caring for in just a moment. Um, but the point is, again, if we use Gary's top pot soil, we wouldn't be dealing with this collapsed soil structure, which basically what's happening is, as the roots are growing into the container within the pot, um, what's happening is as the soil compacts, those roots are also collapsing upon themselves and the plant ultimately stresses from that and isn't able to perform as well as it otherwise could if it's in an ideal soil, which we're going to um, discuss further as we continue with this lesson. So the next gardening tip is that it's preferred to repot your plants towards the end of the day rather than repotting your plants in the morning. By repotting your plants in the morning, they're going to have to endure the hottest high hot temperatures of the afternoon all day long compared to if you repot your plants towards the end of the day they'll have all evening in the cooler temperatures to make sure that they don't dry out and and don't endure the afternoon sun stresses and they'll perform better if you can overcome that initial first day stress of being repotted so the do is to make sure that you repot your plants towards the end of the day instead of doing your repotting in the morning the next helpful tip is to repot your plants every three to five years. The goal is by repotting your plants to rejuvenate them. And this is where, for example, even your bonsais will benefit by, um, by basically repotting it every three to five years. And we're gonna be doing that. And you can even repot it back into the original container as we're gonna do here with this particular fig on my left. We're gonna be doing, um, basically repotting it back into the original container. But a fig such as this one here in front of me, it's important, depending on the size of the container, to repot it maybe every one year as it's going to continue to outgrow its container size until it finally reaches a container that it wants to live its entire life. Um, for example, a blackjack fig, which is only going to grow 8 to 10 feet, might do very well in a 10 to 15 gallon size container compared to a mission fig, which naturally grows to about 20 to 25 feet, may need something closer to 30 to 50 gallon size container in order to perform well um, for the duration of its life. So again, you gotta keep in mind what the plant's going to do, how it's gonna perform, um, and ultimately you're gonna design and, and manage and create a plant that's gonna be happy in the container that you're gonna put it in. And there's different tricks of accomplishing that, and we're gonna discuss one of those where you can actually create a dwarf tree for something that would naturally wanna grow large and we're gonna to get to that in just a second as well. So another tip I wanna share with you before we get to planting is that the best season for repotting your plants is towards the end of winter, late winter, after the chance of frost has passed in your growing zone and before the spring burst of new growth is the ideal window for repotting your plants. So the goal with that being is Repotting your plants in the winter while the plant is dormant isn't going to do much for the plant. You're simply taking the plant from a small container and maybe putting it into a larger container. But while the plant is dormant, even if it's an evergreen such as a citrus tree or a rose bush or um, any other type of plant, in the winter time, even your camellias that are blooming and actually it looks like a lot's happening, they're actually dormant in the winter. There's very little happening compared to spring, summer, and fall. So my ideal best window of the year for repotting your plants again is towards the end of winter after the chance of frost has passed and before the spring burst of new growth. So ideal window, but otherwise 
best time for repotting outside of the best time would still be spring, summer, and late fall. Um, and again, with the late fall disclaimer being, hopefully there's still some growth happening in the plant before it truly slows down as most plants do for the duration of winter. And now let's get started with planting. So here I am now with my raspberry latte fig, which was gifted to me by Joseph Yakira of Figs and Things, and I just want to thank him for that. Um, when he gave it to me, it was simply about two to three inches long, and that was just back in January 20th when he created this particular cutting. And as you can see now, it's about three feet long, more than two. Um, like I said, probably closer to three feet long. And, um, and here it is October, um, simply nine months later, and we've got all of this new growth. It looks like it's stressing, and in fact it is, and I'm gonna share with you why um, in another tip, which is coming up in just a few minutes. Um, but the first thing I wanna do is get this big potted into a larger container, which today is simply going from this one gallon into a gallon pot, and um, ideally, with a fig like this, if the goal is to graduate to the point that it's gonna stay in a pot all of its life, I'd probably graduate it into a two gallon container or um, over here I've got about a three to four gallon container and then I've even got this larger 11 gallon container. But for me and within my garden, I only have a very few number of potted plants. Um, and again, I'm, sure I'm surrounded by all these black containers if you were to use black, you gotta put in some shady spot so that it's not taking that direct beating by the sun, cooking the root ball, and compromising the life of your plant. Um, but these again are all starter containers, and for those of you that know me, most of these figs are gonna end up grafted onto my, now I'm at a seven and one fig tree. Um, maybe we'll take a sneak peek there in just a minute as well when I um, share a couple lessons as well. But the first thing we're gonna do here is prepare the container. This is something I wanna do with you together. So this here is the um, porous clay pot. And the first thing we're gonna do is simply take some rocks or I've also got these pieces of, from broken clay pots that I save for the specific purpose of simply filtering the water as it passes so it doesn't wash that potting soil mixture that I put in here. So, and it also, I don't wanna say it'll so much help with drainage, but it will help prevent also blockage as well. So you wanna position it in a way where you're not using the ceramic piece over here to simply block the hole. The goal is to put it in angles like so, and this here will better help water as it comes through get out of the container. So the goal is to make sure that when water is added that it passes through quickly. So that's the first thing we're gonna do is we're adding rocks and broken ceramic pieces to about the bottom half an inch to an inch. And the next thing we're gonna do is, I just bragged about how good Gary's best potting mix is. We're simply gonna use that. If you wanna take a look at its content, which we just reviewed the ingredients, you can see here what the product looks like as well. But this here is going to last a lot longer and as we discussed, this here is described as being a, um, a permanent soil, being it's gonna be longer lasting. So we're gonna add soil to the bottom, um, the bottom part of the container. We're gonna wanna make sure that when we add the new planted plant, that the soil level is gonna remain the same um, as where it is in this container. So. Um, but again, the goal is also to bring it up as we are expecting some settling to occur. Um, so now we're simply going to pull it out. You may notice that there's all of these roots below it. And the reason is, is because this pot was resting on the soil rather than resting on a concrete surface. So this basically enabled the plant's roots to simply grow out of the container and that naturally helped the plants encourage and support more growth. Um, I'm gonna share that lesson as a do in just a minute as another helpful tip in regards to positioning your pots around your garden as well. So what we're gonna do next, and this may surprise some of you, but we're simply gonna take our pruners here and prune these roots off. And then 
we're going to remove the plant from the container. And you can see here what Joseph has done with his potted plant is he's got this screen that's on it to help keep the, and this is another wonderful lesson. Thank you, Joseph, for doing this. Um, but you can see all of this perlite that's coming out at the base. So we basically use a screen to keep the potty mix from washing out, all of this perlite to further help with aeration of the roots. And the... Here we go. And you can see that these roots are pretty straight, growing straight down. There's no coiling happening. There's still some air roots that are holding all of this soil together. We're gonna try to not further disturb it. This looked pretty um, extreme what we've just done. The air roots we've left intact. We're not gonna try to disturb it any further. This was um, quite intense, but you're gonna see with the other lessons that the patterns are pretty similar with what we're doing here. We're now going to, since we prune the roots, you gotta do the same thing to the plants as well. So we're now gonna also prune the plant like so. So we've just taken off a good third of the plant and we've gained two thirds of the growth and we've also got a healthier, thicker, happier looking plant. And some of the droopiness that you see was because we pulled it out of the ground and these roots that we pruned were stressed. Um, and we're gonna correct that in just a moment here. So we're gonna simply put it here in the container. So my goal is to basically keep the plant about a half an inch to a quarter of an inch from the top where I'll basically be adding the water. And the goal is with the roots to keep the roots growing straight down into the growing medium rather than allowing it to crush and fold upon itself. So we're gonna continue adding some more potting mix around it like so. And again, the tip we just discussed is to make sure that the surface of the soil from the last container is still in the same position in the new container. And you can see we've left the soil medium about a half an inch, quarter of an inch from the rim. So that'll allow area for watering. So the lesson that we just discussed, and this is on um, the next helpful tip when potting your plants, is to make sure that you, one, root prune, and secondly, prune the plant as well whenever repotting the plant. And that'll basically encourage further root growth and development. And by pruning the plant as well, comparable to the amount of roots that were pruned, you'll basically alleviate that stress to the plant. The next and important step is to make sure you water. And when you water your potted plants, you wanna make sure you water them thoroughly. You wanna make sure you soak that entire root ball every time when you go to water. So here we are with our watering can. And again, you can see we've left that room for adding water so that the soil medium can soak itself. One lesson I wanna share with you, and this is another helpful tip is, and I've just said it, is you wanna make sure you soak that root ball all too many times. Eventually, the potting mix and the roots and, um, and any holes that are created by um, beneficial worms and, and, and other life that may be in the soil will basically allow the water to travel from the surface to the base of the pot quickly without soaking the entire root ball. To basically prevent your ability to adequately soak the root ball, I recommend using a saucer. There's a lot of gardeners that are opposed to the use of saucers because it can potentially rot the soil if you allow water in the saucer over a prolonged period of time. When using a saucer, make sure that if there is water accumulated in the saucer, which the goal is when watering your plants, and let's do so together. And the goal is when watering your plants is to make sure that when you water it, and here we go, we can see that the saucer is now collecting water. When I water my plants, and you can see it here, it's um, bubbling, allowing the water to come through, and I'm seeing the saucer now slowly fill up with water. The goal when watering it is I want my saucer to simply fill up with water and stay wet for at least one hour, maybe even a few hours. That'll allow all of the water to return back into the potting mix, make sure that root ball and all of the roots within the container are wet and basically in contact with the roots. 
again, for optimal health and, and, the, and the life and the longevity of the plant. But the goal is to make sure that it doesn't stay wet for more than one day. By the second day, if it's still sitting in water, that soil mix is potentially gonna begin to rot, and that's basically gonna cause disease to the plant and, and ultimately lead to root rot. So um, the goal is to not allow water to continuously pool around the plant, and especially in the winter months, you may not need a saucer at all. Another helpful tip, and this isn't one of my tips that I'm listing, but underneath all of my saucers, I basically use some marbles, which I basically save, and glue onto the base so that when I basically put them on my concrete surfaces that um, water is allowed to pass underneath without basically having a pot rotting and especially on wooden decks it'll quickly lead to wood rot when you've got wet potted plants on your wooden deck so this is a way to basically alleviate um, some of the stresses to your concrete or your wooden decks um, and it's just a simple lesson that I've learned from another gardener that I want to share with you as well. So the do is make sure you prune the roots, make sure you prune the plant and make sure when you water, you soak the plant. And another thing too is by practicing the method of using a saucer, the goal is when we go to feeding the plant, which is going to be another lesson we're going to discuss shortly. But when feeding the plant, you don't want all of those fertilizers to just quickly rush out and away from the container in the pot. By having the saucer, at least those elements will be there in the water and returning right back into the root ball where you want it to stay. Um, another lesson, in the event you're not using a saucer to collect that moisture, and we just said it just a few minutes ago, you may wanna consider putting your potted plants and its container on the ground. And let me share an example of what we've done within the garden. Follow me. So here are some more figs that I got and um, collected from Figs and Things, again from my friend Joseph Yakira. And if you take a look at all of these figs, and I, again I accumulated towards the beginning of the year, you'll notice that all of the figs are buried about um, maybe a half an inch to a quarter of an inch below the ground. And that's the reason that when we took, the, took a look at the last container, you can see that the roots were um, basically growing out of the container and into the ground. Take a look at this Saint Rita. If you come in a little closer, check out the name over here, Saint Rita, and I'll check out these baby figs that are already happening on this teeny tiny one, one gallon um, little fig tree. It's quite amazing. But this also leads me to my next helpful tip. And it's actually a do not, do not transplant or repot any of your plants that are fruiting. If you do, you compromise losing those fruit. So again, when a plant is supporting fruit on it, you don't wanna repot it because that's an added stress and it will compromise your fruits and your fruit yield. And even if the fruits do stay there, it's gonna compromise the quality of the fruit as well. So if possible, if you can wait, and this looks like it's, this is gonna be a fig I'm gonna to get to enjoy in the next day or two. Um, once I've enjoyed it and harvested and and whatever else, then you can consider it, unless you're not so concerned about the crop this year and you're more interested in the years to come, which I do all of the time, but I just want you to be aware of the fact that if you repot it, that's an added stress that'll compromise at least the quality, if not completely sacrifices that entire yield for that particular year. Um, and now, since we're so close to my 701 fig, let's go and check that out. If you can somehow go there a little bit more and the goal is you're gonna check out like these guys over here so these here are some more um, little figs that I've started by cuttings as well you can see um, how small the container is and I simply use the containers to basically pull them up and into the tree and graft the branches and one of my favorite grafting methods is known as the approach graft this Late winter, I'm going to be using another method known as cleft graft to get a whole bunch more varieties onto this tree. And let's see where the 701 fig tree takes us. But um, one other lesson I want to share with you while we're talking about these containers. Um, and you can see, again, the roots are growing out of it. I keep on pulling it out and putting it back in a position. But the reason I also put it in the ground like so, and you can see I just put it in about a quarter inch, a half an inch in the ground, is that it's getting a lot of moisture 
from the soil as well. And when I'm traveling and maybe I miss like a week of irrigation on a potted plant, that could be devastating. But if it's in the ground, there's still moisture in the soil that'll keep those potted plants alive by simply doing this one very helpful tip. So um, again, the use of a saucer will be helpful. Um, another way for longer, you know, when you're gone, you're gonna be out of town and your potted plants are at risk, just stick them in the ground or at least get them in your sprinkler zone. Um, and it's not so much just the water that you're getting from the sprinklers, they're actually getting a lot of moisture from the soil as the water evaporates out of the soil and works its way into the container. And that's quite beneficial on a lot of our potted plants throughout the garden. And now let's check out the 7-in-1 fig, starting with one of my favorites over here is the tiger fig, also known as the panache fig. And what's so cool about it is it's a very light colored fig with these beautiful green variegated look. Um, and they're quite delicious as well. So we've got our panache tiger fig over here. And in the back over here, we've got our Kadota green figs and even more Kadota um, green figs way up here. And as we work our way through, more Kadota green figs over here. This over here is our brown turkey fig. And on this side, and you may see some of these figs still up in this area over here, is our celestial fig, which is more of a medium to small size fig and quite sweet and also purplish in color. And then down here, we've basically balanced the strengths of these three figs. These two are grafted last year and should have fruited this year, but because we added the strawberry verite, I basically kept these pruned low to make sure that these grafts had a chance at success. So we're expecting these three varieties to fruit next year being over here to the left, the green Isha. This one over here, the strawberry verite grafted in two places using down here the approach graft and up above the cleft graft. And then over here, we've got the Chicago black hardy fig as well. So these are the seven varieties of figs that we've got going on in the garden this early week of October. Well, let's continue with the repotting lesson. So underneath my potted plumeria, let's check out one of these flowers over here. Let's check that out over there. It's so beautiful. So underneath the pot of plumeria, you'll notice that there's a couple other starter plants that I have, but there's one in particular that's been here for over a year. If you come in a little closer and you can see, I've been using the same practice of basically, I've got my containers. All of these pots have their holes for basically allowing water to quickly pass. But this one over here is a lantana that's been in this little teeny tiny container as a starter plant over a year ago. And as I'm pulling on it, the roots are completely embedded within the pot. I'm doing my best to pull it out. I'm gonna have to break a couple more roots with my fingers here to loosen it up. But let's get it out of here. And we're gonna repot this into a more appropriate container. And here we go. There we go. And now let's see what's going on within this container. So for this plant, you can see it's grown at least Two feet, blooming quite beautifully. It's taproot, you can see how quite large it is, almost twice the size of the container that it was put in. And let's examine the root ball, which is, again, this is under the dews. The lesson is root pruning, as well as pruning the upper part of the plant with every time they repot a plant. And the goal is to basically examine the root ball and to see if there's any coiling of roots happening. And in this case, I see that the main root is not coiling, it's coming out of this main stem, this trunk, I can just visualize it's coming through the soil, running down this way. This one over here that's a little bit coiled, I can simply correct by pruning it back. And that'll actually create more roots off of that pruned area and create a more stable plant within the next potted um, container it's going to go into and now I'm simply going to prune and manage the size of the plant as well even though it doesn't look like we did much root pruning by simply pulling it out from the container that it was in behind me um, that was still some added stress and to balance that stress to the plant 
we're going to prune the structure back now. So let's cut, um, let's cut, and when we prune, if you want to follow me, what we're looking for is we're going back to a node. I can see here there's a couple of branches, and when I prune, I like to come in within about a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch of that node, and we're going to prune it at an angle like so. And now these two branches will continue the growth pattern, and I'm simply going to go around the plant and prune it back like so. And here we go. Now we've got a more manageable sized plant, and now let's prepare its container. And for now, again, I'm just dumping it in this uh, gallon container, which was once the raspberry latte over here. And now we're gonna be putting into it this lantana plant, but I obviously know my plants are so gonna make it work. The other thing too, as I'm positioning it within this gallon container, I can see that the root is too long for the container. I can bend it, but I'm already starting a coil, which again is against the principles of your potted plants. The goal with repotting every three to five years is to remove all the coils within the plant. And I'm hoping we're gonna see an example of coiled roots before we end this lesson. But what I'm gonna do is simply prune it back to here and that'll create more roots that'll then um, basically further support and nourish the plant. And now we're gonna continue with the same lesson. Here we can even use um, Joseph Yakira's method of using a screen such as this. We can recycle that and put that back in to the container to basically plug those holes that are at the bottom. Um, or I could have used these rocks to accomplish the same. Um, but the goal again with putting any rocks or in this example a screen is to basically keep the soil medium within the container while at the same time improving the flow of water out of the container. Um, so what we're going to do now is add some soil mix to that. Once we get about halfway up the container, we're simply going to add the plant and continue to fill it in. Next up, soak it. One other helpful tip. If you notice that the plant is stressing even after repotting, and again, the goal is you're gonna be doing, doing this towards the end of the day and it's gonna recover overnight. If you come back out the next morning and it still looks terribly stressed, you may wanna consider doing something as simple as this. And again, the point is, and the reason the plant would be exhibiting any type of stress would be because the roots have been pruned so severely and disrupted that the overall health of the plant above the ground is just out of balance. Um, and to prevent the stress from continuing for days, what can also be accomplished is simply cutting the leaves in half. By simply cutting the leaf back, what you're doing is you're reducing the surface area of water loss, and that'll also help the plant better retain moisture and it should perk up a lot faster than if it has all of the surface area of water it's otherwise losing. But this here will also help minimize the stress to the plant. Let's get on with another example. So my next example is a Eureka lemon cutting. If you take a look at this plant over here, you can see where it was cut at this point. It has sprouted a branch about two inches below and created all of these new leaves. And it's also got a ton of weeds around it. It's important to remove the weeds around the plant as that's all competition. Um, on this point, there's a lot of trees throughout the community. And I get this question all the time where people have ground cover plants around their trees. And it's important to basically have nothing growing in competition with your plant because every time you go to feed your plants, and we're gonna talk about feeding shortly, every time you go to watering your plant, 
every time you do anything with for the plant if you've got all of these other weeds growing in competition with the desired plant they're all taking those resources away and ultimately compromising the health and the life of the desired plant within the container this here I found neglected among a whole bunch of other potted plants within the ground and I thought would make a good example of another plant we can um, repot together it's been in this container and growing for a about the last six months, maybe close to a year. Um, and now let's correct this and put it now into a gallon size container where it will better perform and grow. I put it in this starter cup only to get it to initially root. And let's examine what these roots look like once we remove all the weeds and the plants surrounding it. So the first thing we're gonna do, and you can see that some of the roots have worked its way out of the cracks within the container again, because it was positioned within the soil about a quarter inch to a half an inch. And now let's remove the plant. And this is a very good lesson over here. So, if you come in close enough, I want you to see how these roots are just coiling in circles around and around and around and around. Only a couple of roots made their way out of the container and, um, and, and got into the soil. But you can see that these roots are completely coiled. And you can imagine for the grower that started with a plant like this. And let me remove some of the weeds so I can better demonstrate this. Because those roots that are coiling are of the citrus, of the Eureka lemon tree, and not anything else. There we go. All of the weeds have been removed. Um, but my point is, if the grower simply took a plant from a small container with its coiled roots and then graduated into a larger container, and these coiled roots would basically create another layer of roots that would then grow into the larger container, recoiling to that container, and then they're gonna uproot that and position it into the next larger container where it's gonna continue coiling um, this leads to the lesson that a younger plant that you buy from the nursery will typically perform better and healthier in your home garden than if you got a larger potted plant such as in a container like this. Imagine if this plant graduated five or six or seven times until it finally made it into this container. What's going to end up happening is it's going to have all of these roots that are ultimately girdling, which means choking the underlying plant structure. These roots will be stuck in this position for its entire life if you, the grower, don't fix it. Fixing it by detangling it, opening it out, maybe even pruning it as we've been pruning all the roots. And again, this is one of my lessons is to basically prune some of the roots, but then you also gotta prune some of the plant above the ground and it should be comparable to the amount of roots you're growing to basically even out that stress. But if you don't prune it, then you're gonna end up with a phenomenon known as stem girdling roots, which means the roots ultimately kill the plant as it strangles and chokes the plant. You can imagine if these roots stayed here for the life of the plant, these roots would eventually become an inch, two inches, three inches thick, which means ultimately if it got three inches thick within the small area, it's gonna choke the lifeline of the tree trunk, the primary part of the plant. Um, so that's a reason that every time you go to repot your plant that you correct these coiling root issues. So together, let's pull these apart and see if we can open them. And if we can't, we're gonna have to prune it. And I know this looks stressful, but it's for the best of the plant to do these things. And here we go. And these will be the, or are, the air roots that are helping basically uptake a lot of the minerals and also the oxygen that the plant needs as well. What we're gonna do now is, as we've been doing every single time, is we're gonna prune basically again, a quarter of an inch away from the stem, like so, and at an angle. Got a nice clean cut there. And I'm going to also prune some of these roots even in half, like so. And that'll encourage 
more roots growing in the right direction. I removed a lot of the spiraling. Um, and again, just to prevent the stress to the plant, I can simply cut maybe not all the leaves, but I'll cut half the leaves. And the point being is I'm reducing the surface area for water loss. And now let's continue with repotting as we've been always doing, starting off with some stones at the bottom and then we'll add the potting mix on top. So all of the plants we've repotted, we've done three together and I'm hoping you see the overlapping lessons that we're doing with each of the repotting um, examples. But here's an example where we're gonna repot the same plant into the same container and there's a benefit and reason for it. The first one, as we already discussed, is that the soil level has since collapsed since we did it. But again, we started not using the Gary's Best soil formula. Um, if you're gonna try to create your own soil formula, and we saw the ingredients together, the goal is to use something that's more mineral-based, using stuff like perlite, vermiculite, pumice, charcoal. Um, charcoal, again, is um, not so much mineral as it's basically a carbon source, being it's burnt wood, and will eventually collapse unlike the mineral sources, but the goal is to use um, a potting mix that is higher in percentage with a mineral base rather than using a compost that's higher in, as we saw with one of the potting mixes, instead of using a potting mix that's really high and using um, wood bark and compost and, um, and basically like an amend type product, as those are gonna break down quite quickly and as a result of your potted plant, that root structure is gonna collapse upon itself as well. But here we're basically gonna repot it, we're going to readjust the soil level, and we're gonna see what's happening in the root ball below. And it's been about three years since we've repotted it, and figs being more vigorous can maybe um, be repotted more frequently than um, other plants that are more slow growing. Um, and again, I've been controlling this particular fig and it's um, vigor, this here being a Kadota fig, which can naturally grow easily from to 15 and 25 feet, has comfortably been able to kept into a manageable size because of the practice of root pruning. By pruning the roots, and especially by taking out a large root, will bring the plant back and in check. And it's a way that a lot of people have come the goal of bonsaiing a lot of ornamentals and fruit tree type plants. Um, so let's get started with this. We're gonna carefully bring it out of its container, like so. I'm just resting it on my knee, and I'm carefully removing the soil along the edges. Bear in mind, we've already discussed that if the plant has fruit, and this one here has just a couple of small fruit that won't make it for the year. Most of the fruit we've already enjoyed during the summer months. Now that we're going into fall and the weather's getting cooler, most of these figs will simply rot on the plant um, and never make it to maturity. So we're simply loosening the soil around the root ball and here it comes. And there we go. Take a look at the base first. Let's see what we're dealing with. We can see that we've got all of these fibrous roots. And you can see that I'm breaking this up. There's a little bit of a coil happening around the edges. You can see that all of these roots have pretty much filled in the sides a lot more so than what's happening within the root ball. But the goal is we're gonna loosen and basically bring the entire root zone in an inch, an inch or two off the bottom, an inch going in, and then we're gonna prune the top part of the plant as well. You may notice that some of these clay pieces are falling out to basically block the holes within the container. Here's another clay piece that's coming out. And here we go. And now what we're gonna do is, I'm simply gonna take my paper scissors, these are all really small roots, and I'm simply gonna give it a haircut, like so. Now, we'll go to the sides, 
and do the same thing. We're just gonna give it a little rub down and pull all of the roots that are running in circles. All of those are gonna get a haircut as well. So we're gonna pull these roots back. Anything that's running too long will be pruned away and we'll continue. And that's it. We're basically leaving all of the roots that are near the top um, surface alone. We did all of this root pruning to the sides as well as the bottom as we've just done together. And now let's take a look at the top and what we're going to do here. Most of the life on this plant, and this plant has gone through a couple of stresses. One being we had a 117 degree day where the plant just got roasted. Um, and with it, a lot of the fruit also fell. Um, and another time I was away from the house for about 10 days. And again, being in a pot compared to if it was in the ground, it would have reaped some of the moisture from the ground as well. And it wouldn't have gone through those stresses as well. But that's the reason that most of these leaves are towards the tips instead of along side of all of the new growth that are otherwise pushed this year. This branch is all brand new this year, as well as this branch over here, as well as this branch over here and this branch over here. But what we're gonna do now is we're simply gonna prune it back in half with the idea that those nodes are gonna create a little bit more growth before the end of the year. And again, here in Southern California, first week of October, we still have warmer weather through November um, and it may push out depending on the microclimate within your garden. But if it has enough warmth and light, it'll grow a few more inches this year and just basically um, have a better design, a better shape going into winter. And it'll just basically have all of those buds in place um, for ideal growth for next year. But keep in mind, specifically with a fig tree, all of the figs come on its new growth. So it's not so important that we basically get buds, bud growth um, this year to create flowers or ultimately fruit for next year. All of next year's fruits are gonna come out on the new growth. So it's not so important to basically get growth this year in order to create the maximum fruit harvest for next year. But in regards to pruning, let's prune together now. Um, if you follow me along the stem, my goal is simply to prune it back in about in half. I'm simply gonna go down the stem. I'm looking for a node. I'm looking for nodes also. I can see where that leaf node was last. So a bud will come out at this particular juncture and continue the growth out in this direction compared to if I picked a bud that was on the inside, it would grow in towards the center of the plant. The goal is to continue this vase shape pattern growth. And so I'm simply gonna prune like so, about a quarter inch away from this node. And I'm hoping you can capture um, that node right there. And then as we continue up, again, you can see there's a node here, node here, node here, node there. If you come in closer, you may see right here is even a bud for growth. This bud, if it were to grow, would grow in this direction. Um, it could also be a fig, but regardless, um, the action is gonna come out at this particular point. So we can either go in this direction or my preference would be to go away from the center. So I'm ch opting for away. So I'm pruning right in that direction. And I'm gonna continue the same as we go around. And the last cut will be right here. And now let's prepare to repot it back into the same container. First thing we're gonna do, and with this one, there's only one drain hole. Not an ideal situation, and you have to be very careful with your watering practice, but with one drain hole, that's the reason that you only saw a couple of these pieces coming out. We simply put those near the drain hole to make sure that when you water, that the soil basically doesn't interfere with or block that surface. We're gonna go in there with a couple more rocks. I'm gonna put rocks in there first, a couple of these tile pieces second, and I'm gonna put a couple more rocks just to make sure that the position is held. A lot more perlite. And now what we'll do, and now what we'll do next is if there's an issue or you've had experience, um, depending on where you are in the country with a lot of root rot or there's just excessive moisture within your um, container plants, a way to easily correct it is by adding a lot more perlite to the potting mix near the bottom as well as the top of the container. And, um, and let's do that. 
So what we're gonna add is we begin to add some soil, some potting mix to the container. We're gonna add also a lot of perlite to the mix. I'd say almost like a 50-50 between the potting mix, which already has perlite in it. We're gonna add more perlite. Again, the benefits is prevents soil compaction, promotes strong root development, excellent for starting cuttings. The main purpose is it's just gonna further increase drainage and get the water away from the root zone. So what we'll do is we'll start off with some potting soil. You can see now I basically added about two inches of potting mix. And now we're gonna go with the perlite. And you can see that we've already got perlite in here. But as much potting mix as I just added, I'm gonna add about the same volume of perlite to that. And now we'll basically mix the potting mix together. And now we've got excellent draining soil near the base. And now we'll have a potting mix that has the sphagnum moss and all these other components to basically create a more well-rounded potting mix in the surrounding root zone area. So now let's check the position of the plant. The goal when potted as with all of our other potted plants, is to stay within a quarter inch to a half an inch of the surface. It's okay to air towards a little bit higher under the assumption that there'll be a little bit of settling happening as well, depending on the soil mix you use. If you use Gary's Best, there's gonna be minimal um, com you know, um, settling happening. And now we'll continue backfilling with the potting soil like so. And usually the lesson is, and you can take a look at where the roots are coming out of the plant here in this area. Typically the rule is whatever the root level and the soil level was from the prior container, you're gonna to wanna to continue that for the life of the plant. But in this case, we know that the prior container, a lot of that soil simply washed away and collapsed away from the plant. The soil level was at least another quarter inch, if not a half an inch higher to basically protect that root zone. We're gonna go up a little bit higher than the roots to basically protect the roots from the elements, especially sunburn. Being the prior product, just having so much forest products within it, that simply disintegrated, exposing the entire plant structure. You may notice that as I'm backfilling around the plant, I'm going with my fingers as well, trying to remove any air pockets around the plant. I'm not pressing too hard. I'm just gently trying to remove the air pockets so that the roots are not exposed to air and simply drying out within the potted container. Well, I hope you found all of these gardening tips helpful, and if so, be sure to give us a thumbs up, and most importantly, by subscribing down below, you'll be connected to this and all of our other educational gardening videos. We hope all of these helpful tips help make this your best growing season ever, and never stop growing with Ivory Organics. Wishing you all the best with your gardens and happy gardening.